So Tuesday night, my daughter Ren and I were talking while I was eating a late dinner, a buffalo chicken calzone from Aldi. It was healthy, right? It was the first time I had had the buffalo chicken calzone, and while I should have anticipated, I was surprised by how spicy it was. My wife Kristen recommended ranch dressing for my calzone because we didn't have any tomato sauce open, and Ren, who studied nutrition at Appalachian State, said that ranch dressing was good for neutralizing spicy foods. I didn't know. The conversation Ren and I had that we were engaged in was <clears throat> a fairly deep one and included comments that I had made about the Roman Emperor Constantine after his conversion to Christianity in 312 AD and how with his mother Helena, sites in the Holy Land were, where stories from the life of Jesus were believed to have taken place have been marked often with churches. I added, however, that we can't be absolutely certain that all of them were exactly where Jesus walked. Wren reflected on that statement and said that the important thing is not precisely where Jesus walked, but that he was here on earth among us. Well, right at that moment, I was in the middle of a bite from the calzone, and I was delighted with how much the ranch dressing had, in fact, taken the sting out of its spiciness. And in a sincere effort to affirm my daughter for her good advice about the ranch dressing, I told her that she had taught me something. She beamed with joy after I said this, that is, until she realized that I wasn't referring to her theological insight about the importance of Jesus walking among us on earth, wherever that was, but rather about ranch dressing on spicy foods. Suddenly, the words of affirmation from her pastor father didn't seem quite so great. And once she made this clear, of course, we laughed, both of us, and we, I finally did let her know how impressed I was with her other far more important insight she had shared. I mean, sometimes we, and I mean all of us in this case, are not on the same page when engaged in conversation. Take, for example, the conversation that was taking place between Jesus and his disciples in today's scripture from the Gospel of Mark that we heard moments ago. The passage begins by noting that Jesus and his followers were traveling through Galilee, which is in the northern part of Palestine at that time. Mark says Jesus didn't want anyone to know they were there because he was trying to teach his disciples. There were important lessons he was trying to impart, and he likely didn't want to be interrupted by crowds seeking healing for themselves or for family members, which was often the case. He needed some alone time with the disciples. Jesus told his inner circle of followers that he was going to be betrayed and killed before rising from the dead on the third day. This was about the same thing that he had said to them earlier as recorded in chapter 8, which we heard about last Sunday. They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to get across, and they were afraid to ask, Mark says. Just as Ren and I weren't on the same page at, for, our, for a moment in our conversation with her being on a much higher plane than I was, so too were the disciples not following where Jesus was, take, talk, was, ta uh, was trying to take them, rather. Perhaps because their focus was elsewhere, as we'll see in a moment. Now, I don't know that they were eating spicy calzones, but they were missing the big picture as I was. I think the bigger problem, though, is not their misunderstanding, but rather their reluctance to ask Jesus to explain what he meant. What was behind that? I mean, these are Jesus' closest followers, his inner circle of disciples, as I said a moment ago. So why would they, of all people, be clam up when Jesus spoke over their heads? One commentator suggests it was because they actually did get some idea of what Jesus was saying, and it troubled them so much that they didn't want to hear any more about it, so they were silent. Is that how we are sometimes with Jesus? Are there things we read in the Bible that he said that disturb us so much that we kind of shut down? Is the challenge of contemplating what he says at times so overwhelming that we just grow still and let it pass in silence? There are plenty of passages in the Gospels when what Jesus says is a little or a lot disturbing or jarring. So is it a matter of it's not being easy to listen to and consider when applying to our lives that causes us to sort of grow quiet. The problem is with that, 
that when we shut down on our end, we diminish our relationship or at least the quality of our relationship with Jesus. To be clear, it's not Jesus who holds back on his love for us, but rather it's we who pull away from him or at least fail to reach out to him with the same amount of longing and thus intimacy or connection. Now, it may not be that we're troubled by something, Jesus says, but that we just don't bother seeking answers to our questions about the Bible and life and how they fit together. Now, I realize that we're not all wired the same. Some of us might be stuck on calzones and ranch ranch dressing, while others among us may be focused on deeper matters, such as Jesus' incarnation. And sometimes it just depends upon where we are in the moment. My point, though, is this. Our relationship with Christ is diminished when we fail to engage fully with him. When we hesitate to bring him, to him rather, in prayer and meditation, our questions, our wonders, our worries, our hopes, our fears, even our complaints. Just as any human relationship thrives when the parties to it are open and honest with one another and, interact, and fully interact with each other, so too is our union with Christ blessed when we turn to him with honesty and yearning for his guidance and presence in our lives. We shift now to the second part of this passage where in verse 33, Mark says, they arrived at Capernaum and were in the house. You think about what that means, the house. Well, the house may very well have been Peter's house where his mother-in-law was healed by Jesus in the first chapter of Mark and where in Capernaum today a church stands over what is believed to be where it's located. Now, I don't know whether that was because of the actions of Helena, the, the mother of Constantine or not, but there is a church that marks that place and many archaeologists believe that is the place. Anyway, Jesus asked the disciples what they were arguing about as they were walking there. And this time they were really silent, kind of like the cat that ate the canary, because they had been debating about who among them was the greatest. Who was the goat? What a contrast to what Jesus had just taught them about his being betrayed and killed. He makes this earth-shattering prediction about himself, and their response is to fight over which of them is top dog. Then Jesus sits down, and that's the typical position of a rabbi when teaching with the students standing, and he says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Whoever wants to be, excuse me, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus flips the script. He gives his followers, and that would include you and me, a new rule of discipleship in his kingdom. Those deserving the highest honor are those who lower themselves the most. Last Sunday, we saw discipleship being played out in self-giving sacrifice. Today, we learn that true discipleship is found in humility. The term servant of all carried more punch than we might realize. Sharon Ringe says it referred to someone who serves meals and that the person who was servant of all was the lowest in rank of all the servants, the one who would be allowed to eat only at what was left after everybody else had had their fill. The bottom of the bottom. This notion flips the script because it runs counter to our natural impulse to seek to elevate ourselves often at the expense of others around us, just as the disciples were doing in their argument about who among them was the goat. It's not always easy to be humble or even to try. I read that Benjamin Franklin apparently listed character traits that he desired to master. When he felt that he had achieved one, he would then work on another. And according to what I read, he was fairly successful with this plan. That is, until he tried to be humble. Whenever he started to think he was making progress significantly, he got so pleased with himself that he became proud. (laughs) I also read, as the story goes, that when Frederick the Great asked his court preacher if he knew anything about the future life, the preacher answered, yes, your majesty, it is absolutely certain that in the future life, your highness will not be king of Prussia. Jesus flips the script, calling us to humble ourselves, and then he does something to drive home his point, which was much more surprising in his day and time than ours, even shocking. He takes a small child and he places him among his gathered disciples and then he takes the child in his arms and he says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. Now, 
In this day and time, we don't find that all that surprising because we celebrate childhood and we lift up our children happily and overtly. Today in the 11 o'clock service, we're going to rejoice over the baptism of 11-year-old Lainey Harris. Our liturgy affirms our warm welcome of, infant, of baptized infants such as her who then become part of our church family and whom we all promise to nurture in the faith. And that picture is, I don't know if you can see it or not, but that's, that's my daughter sitting on my lap many years ago when my hair was much darker. Uh, <laughs> Back in Jesus' day, though, and in that culture, children weren't seen as full persons and would not have been invited in the company of a male teacher and his, his pupils. Children stayed with the women of the household. So this scene must have been a little shocking to observers. And then for Jesus to say that welcoming a little child was the same as welcoming him and even God was over the top for them. Again, Jesus flips the script. And the child he brings into the fold represents more than just a small human being. There's metaphor at work. This little child, someone on the margins of society 2,000 years ago, might stand for all persons, adults as well as children, in need of help or dependent on others for the basics of life or of a low social class or pressed to the edges because of some ism. Jesus brings them all in. For this to happen then and now, however, humility is required on the part of those welcoming the little child. It's so important for members of the in crowd to be humble, something true even of churches today. As com commentator and professor Feem Perkins notes, one of the most difficult tasks for volunteers at soup kitchens, homeless shelters, and other service organizations is to treat with dignity the people whom they are helping. Whether we're aware of it or not, we really do have to be careful not to come across with an air of superiority because we're not suffering the way the persons we're helping are. But for the grace of God, there go I, right? And let me pause and say something for all of the children who are among us today. Jesus loves you, and we love you too. And you are loved and valued and always welcome. This was something we're talking about 2,000 years ago where people saw things differently. But you are loved by Jesus and by us. One way to show humility is to admit that we all have shortcomings. We're all broken in some way and in need of the healing that Jesus provides. Years ago, Henry Nouwen wrote a book titled The Wounded Healer about ministers today and how they manage to offer healing to others in the midst of their own struggles. And he shared the legend found in the Jewish Talmud that goes like this. Rabbi Yahshua ben Levi came upon Elijah the prophet while he was standing at the entrance of Rabbi Simeron ben Yohai's cave. He asked Elijah, when will the Messiah come? Elijah replied, go and ask him yourself. Where is he? Sitting at the gates of the city. How shall I know him? He's sitting among the poor covered with wounds. The others unbind all their wounds at the same time and then bind them up again, but he unbinds his one at a time and then binds them up again, saying to himself, perhaps I shall be needed. If so, I must always be ready so as not to delay for a moment. Now in summarizes the story to make his point. The Messiah in the story, the story tells us is sitting among the poor, binding his wounds one at a time, waiting for the moment when he will be needed. So it is with the minister. I would add, so it is with all of us, clergy and laity, who minister <clears throat> and are called to bring Christ's good news of healing and hope to a hurting world. We do so, all of us, with our own wounds. Well, maybe if we begin with that acknowledgement, with that honesty, with that humility, then we might be a whole lot more effective in reaching others with the healing love of Christ. In his book mentioned last Sunday, A Time to Heal, J.R. Briggs maintains that only with our woundedness are we able to offer healing to others. Now think about that. Only with our woundedness are we able to offer healing to others. Without experiencing failure, disappointment, loss, and pain, how can we empathize with and lead others who have experienced or are experiencing these things, he writes. 
Without such personal pain, we're prone to being arrogant, distant, and unmerciful, he says. Failure has a way of teaching us things success never can, he adds. And he believes that if we humble ourselves and demonstrate vulnerable brokenness for others to witness, then it will build deeper connection, trust, and empathy with them. I would wholeheartedly agree. Humility is a key to our connecting with other persons, and it's a key to our connecting with Christ as well. Pride shuts off our openness to learning from anyone, including from Jesus. By humbling ourselves, on the other hand, we're more open to Christ's wisdom, Christ's positive influence, Christ's restorative love. I want to end with something personal. And again, it involves my daughter, Wren. She's now in her mid-20s and is a bright and beautiful young woman with a deep faith in Jesus Christ, who, in, which, in which she lives into with authenticity. She has matured over the years into this wonderful person. The truth is, I too have matured over the years in relation to her. Because as she went from a little girl to a teenager to a young adult, I had to learn not always to be the dad with the ready answers, the purveyor of wisdom, at least from my perspective. She didn't always want to hear what I said, which eventually I discovered as she grew older was because she wanted to be seen by me as a responsible, intelligent, trustworthy person. This sometimes created tension because I wouldn't remove my dad cap. You know, we're issued one at the hospital when they're born, and, and, and sometimes it's a tight fit and doesn't come off very well. Eventually, however, I came to understand that I had to humble myself and show Wren the respect she yearned for and let her make more decisions. Now, I still struggle with taking off my dad cap now and then, and oftentimes she's glad I'm wearing it. But my point is this. Our relationship to be healthy and happy required my showing humility in welcoming this little girl in my mind's eye, and she always will be, into the world of adulthood. I'm still her father who worries about her, but I'm now also the recipient of her wisdom, such as about ranch dressing and on calzones and the importance of Jesus walking the earth. Jesus is telling us likewise that our relationship with him and with all others will be the happiest and most fulfilling if we humble ourselves.